the final video in our oscillation series and we're going to be talking about energy resonance and damping in this video. We have quite a lot of specification points to get through so let's get into it. First thing we're going to talk about is energy. It's fairly straightforward. We're going back to our trolley. If you haven't watched my previous videos using this trolley spring system where I've looked at graphs and equations then please do because it connects into all that we're going to be talking about here about oscillations and speed and figuring out what energies are involved. So if we have our trolley here and again like we did before we pull our trolley all the way over to the right hand side and that's where we start our oscillation. If we pull our trolley over to the right obviously this spring here is going to get stretched and when a spring is stretched we know that it has elastic potential energy. So when we pull our trolley over to the right hand side all of the energy that the trolley has at that point is elastic potential energy, which we know is given by a half k x squared. And of course, in this situation, we can replace our x with our amplitude because the maximum displacement is the amplitude. When we let the trolley go, it's then going to come shooting back towards the middle and then carry on over to the left hand side where we'll get back to our maximum potential energy just on the other spring this time. But in the center part here, this is where it has its maximum velocity. And of course, all of our energy at that point is going to be kinetic energy, which we know is half mv squared. This v here is our maximum velocity and we have an equation for maximum velocity giving us our kinetic energy to be half m on a omega squared. So as the trolley oscillates back and forth, the energy switches from potential energy to kinetic energy to potential energy again just on the other side to kinetic and so on. And because energy is a scalar quantity and not a vector, we're just talking about numbers here, not directions. Energy is conserved in this process, so all of this potential energy is going to get converted into kinetic energy and all that kinetic energy back to potential, provided, of course, we are assuming there's no friction here. This is an ideal system. We've got no friction, we've got no air resistance, we've got no energy being transferred out of the system. In other words, this is an undamped system. And we'll be talking more about damping later on in this video, but undamped means we've got no forces acting that are taking energy out of the system. If we wanted to graph the energy in the system, it would look something like this. We've got our two types of energy here, our kinetic energy as it passes through the center and our potential energy. And you can see these are just a direct swap from one to the other as the trolley goes through its oscillation. And of course, this applies to any oscillator. The trolley is simply an example. Notice, of course, that the total system energy remains the same. This is the ideal situation. It is undamped oscillations. If the oscillation is damped, this is not quite what you would see because some energy would be dissipated into the surroundings. Now, let's talk about this idea of resonance and what it is. Again, we go back to our trolley. When you pull the trolley over to the right hand side and you let it go, it oscillates back and forth. And again, assuming there's no friction with what is called its natural frequency or FO. That natural frequency will depend on a lot of things in the system, the springs that you're using, the mass of the trolley, etc. It oscillates back and forth with this natural frequency. You can add energy into this system and make it oscillate with greater amplitude if you apply a push at just the right moment. So if you start with relatively small oscillations, you can, just as it's over at its maximum amplitude, give it a little extra push and cause the amplitude to increase. So you've put energy into the system because remember, energy and amplitude are proportional. So applying a force can put energy into the system. And this is what we call a forced oscillation. Applying an extra external force, if you like, that causes energy to be put in. If you don't push it at exactly the right time, if you sort of randomly add a force in, and in a random direction. So you might add in a force that regularly increases the amplitude of the oscillation, or if you're putting in forces at different frequencies, then you can instead remove energy from the system. So you've got to time this addition very well if you want the amplitude of the oscillation to increase. The object that provides a forced oscillation is called the driver. Imagine a child on a swing. As they go back and forth, the adult at one end just regularly adds a force in 
just at the top of the oscillation to keep the child going on the swing or to increase the amplitude of that. This is the driver. You are adding force and therefore acceleration and therefore amplitude and therefore energy into the system. If the frequency of the driver matches the natural frequency of the system, your adult with the child on the swing pushes at just the right time, then you get maximum energy transfer and maximum amplitude of oscillation. This is what resonance is. The definition, when the driving frequency matches the natural frequency of a system, maximum energy transfer occurs and you get maximum amplitude oscillations. You can express this in graphical terms. You see here down here, this is the natural frequency of the system at this point. And along this axis, we have our driving frequency. So as the frequency of your driver increases, the amplitude of the oscillation start to increase. But when you hit the natural frequency of the system, there's your maximum amplitude oscillation. Some examples of this are microwave ovens. So microwave ovens are designed to produce microwaves at the natural frequency of water molecules. So when you put food, which contains water molecules, into the microwave, those water molecules pick up energy from the microwaves, and that energy is used to heat the food. Or, if a truck passes your house and the windows rattle, this is where the frequency of the noise produced by the truck matches the natural frequency of your windows, and you get this vibration, maximum vibration because of it. Other examples that have come up in exam questions to magnets on springs and they're connected by a coil and as one magnet oscillates in and out of the coil it induces an EMF and so it connects into magnetic fields as well. The other one that has come up before and gives us an example of a classic answer is the singing bowl. And this is the question here, when you rub the handles the bowl sings, producing a loud note with a frequency of 720 hertz. Now in this example they give us the natural frequency of the bowl. You attach a vibration generator and the signal is adjusted to produce frequencies from 600 to 800. So this is us increasing the driving frequency like we had on the graph from 600 to 800. So we should realize from that graph that as you move from 600 up to 800, as soon as you hit 720 hertz, you're going to get maximum oscillations and the bowl will sing. Remember, of course, that that's not an absolutely horizontal line before you hit that natural frequency. So you will get increased sound being produced by the bowl because 600 to 800 is around that natural frequency. But you'll note they say the sound is quiet for all frequencies except 720 when it is much louder. A question like this has a standard answer. And I'm going to use the mark scheme for this particular question and show you how you can use that answer for pretty much any resonance question. The only thing that might be different for any particular question is you may or may not get the natural frequency of the bowl, or it could be a different number. Your first point being, we have a driver. So you identify in the question, the driver. Here you would replace generator or hand with whatever the object is that's causing the driver. This is a standard part. When the driving frequency is not the same as the natural frequency of whatever the object is, less energy is transferred. And you should always answer these questions in terms of the energy being transferred. When it hits the natural frequency, resonance occurs. You should always make sure that you mention the word resonance when you're talking about the driving frequency matching the natural frequency. And that's the next point here. And then finally, there is maximum transfer of energy, so the amplitude is at a maximum. So the things that you are mentioning are natural frequency, driver or driven oscillations, whether the driver matches the natural frequency or not, and what happens when it does, resonance, maximum energy transfer, maximum oscillations. At the top of the video, I talked about undamped oscillations, the idea that you're assuming there's no friction or air resistance, and of course that's not a realistic situation. Damping is 
When you consider the fact that some energy will be removed from the system just either through natural effects like friction and air resistance or deliberate effects. This is the definition of damping, reduction in the amplitude of oscillation as a result of energy being transferred or dissipated from the system to overcome frictional or other resistive forces and it's normally friction that is used here. Remembering that energy is proportional to amplitude squared. So when you take energy out of the system, the amplitude of the oscillation is going to drop. Now all oscillating systems are damped to some extent or another. If you want to keep the oscillation going, it becomes a bit of a nuisance. But in most situations, most engineering situations, having something that oscillates is necessary because it doesn't cause too much strain on a material, but you don't want it to continue oscillating for a long time. So you allow it some flexibility for oscillation and then you damp it afterwards to reduce those oscillations as fast as possible. And this is essentially what happens with your actual oscillations when you look at damping. And you can see it's an exponential decay curve which opens up possibilities for log questions. If you're doing the home A level, it opens up possibilities for damping as part of our paper three graphing question. But it is fairly straightforward. Our amplitude reduces as time goes on. And because amplitude reduces, the energy contained within the system reduces and that energy is dissipated out. And remember that word dissipated is a very useful word when you're trying to describe what happens to that energy. You can have various different kinds of damping depending on whether you want the oscillations to decrease gradually over time, whether you want the oscillations to decrease very quickly over time, but you don't mind the system being out of equilibrium or whether you need it to stop ASAP. And so the blue line here, of course, shows our light regular damping. This would be with something like just using air resistance or the natural friction that is in the system. Very heavy damping. It takes a long time to come back to equilibrium, but it stops the oscillation very quickly. And then this critical damping here brings it back to the equilibrium position ASAP. There are lots of systems that use damping from the suspension system in a car to earthquake proofing of buildings. You want the oscillation because if you don't allow oscillation, the system is not flexible enough to absorb some of the energy that is coming at it. Also, you don't want the system to be oscillating the entire time. So usually you'll have something that increases the natural resistive forces in the system. So your springs might be encased in oil, for example. The key point to remember here is you're removing energy from the system and dissipating it. Now, what about resonance? How does damping affect resonance? Well, obviously, the point of damping is to reduce the amplitude of the oscillation. So we know that the first thing that's going to happen is that the amplitude of the oscillation, even at resonance, is going to decrease. The other thing that happens is that the frequency of the goes towards the left. The natural frequency of a damped system is slightly less than the natural frequency of an undamped system. And of course, the amplitude decreases. The other thing that can help with damping or that causes decreases in the oscillations of a system, of course, is if your material goes into plastic deformation. Because we know when it's elastic, then it absorbs that energy as elastic potential energy and then gives it back as kinetic energy. But of course, if you've got so much energy that you exceed the elastic limit and the material becomes plastic, then you don't get that energy back. So the plastic deformation of materials can affect this energy transfer in oscillating systems. There have been questions about resonance in the past, like the singing bowl that I showed you. And often those are synoptic questions, like the magnets on springs ones that I referenced. There haven't been that many questions on damping because it's more of a qualitative situation. So you need to be able to describe what happens to the energy. You don't need to be able to do calculations about it. There may be something coming about using your SHM equations, using energy calculations to figure out what happens with the amplitude of oscillations and their energy over time. So do be prepared for that. Make sure that you're familiar with energy equations and how they connect into our SHM equations.